Good afternoon, if you're joining us from Israel, and a very early good morning if you're joining us from the U.S. I believe there are a few new faces in the audience today, so if this is your first Tech Meets Design event, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Alona, Alona Stern, and I'm the head of content for Tech Meets Design. So just for background, Tech Meets Design is an initiative that was born in Jerusalem where we bring the tech and design communities together to create a nexus point between the two. And in doing so, we're really aiming to highlight the critical role that design plays in technology and in the development of technology. In today's case, we are honing in on a sector and exploring what happens when you identify the challenges and you look for solutions through the lens of integrating both tech and design. We see Jerusalem as a unique venue for driving a global conversation around tech and design, in large part because of our first-rate academic partners, Bethlehem Academy of Art and Design, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israeli College of Engineering, as well as our governmental partner, the Jerusalem Development Authority, which aims to promote Jerusalem's tech ecosystem. Israel is a leader in the digital health and life sciences sector, and Jerusalem is a key player. About a third of the city's startups are in the biotech and life sciences space. Perhaps it's a little less known that Jerusalem also has a thriving tech ecosystem of its own. As we all know, COVID has led to a speed of innovation to many sectors, but perhaps the most significant is that of healthcare. A recent McKinsey survey of leaders in this space found that 90% agree the pandemic will fundamentally change the way they do business, requiring new products, new services, processes, and even business models. So we at TechMeets Design are proposing <laughs> that an important layer be introduced into that conversation when discussing innovation. That of a human, and in the context of healthcare, a patient-centered approach. And we believe that design and related methodologies such as design thinking really can provide that layer. So we are thrilled to share the stage today with a panel of truly leading experts when it comes to design and healthcare. I will start off by introducing Dr. Morgan Hutchinson and then hand it over to her to introduce the rest of the speakers. Dr. Morgan Hutchinson is a practicing emergency room physician and an assistant professor at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson Host University in Philadelphia. She is the Director of Education at Health Design Lab and leads a design thinking program for medical students, the first of its kind for a US medical school. The past year, she and her colleagues have been spearheading community-based responses to the pandemic. Welcome, Morgan, the stage is yours. The Health Design Lab um, in Philadelphia, we are joining you from, is a creative maker space that brings together doctors, designers, and other cool people. And here we work together to tackle some of the greatest challenges in healthcare. So during this hour, I am honored to be introducing three inspiring speakers that will all share their unique perspectives on the intersection of de design and health. Please share your questions in the chat box and we will save time for those questions at the end of the hour. First, I'd like to introduce our graphic recorder. Graphic recording is a method of capturing powerful images and texts from a conversation. It encourages engagement and it helps us to virtually record the key points from our work together. Today we're joined by the graphic recorder, Suzanne Oshur. She'll be visually documenting this session and thank you, Suzanne, very much for joining us. Our first speaker today is my colleague and friend, Dr. Bon Koo. Dr. Bon Koo is a practicing emergency physician here at Sydney Kimmel Medical College. He is a co-founder and director of the Health Design Lab, where he created the first design thinking program in a US medical school. He co-authored the book, Health Design Thinking, which addresses unique design challenges in the healthcare space. Welcome, Bon. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Thumbs up, cool. Um, so. I'm, I'm just here to, as an opening act for uh, Dr. Ibrahim and Alan Chachanoff. I admire them so much. Uh, Morgan's gonna give them an, a nice intro 
But I wanted to speak about um, the importance of design in healthcare and why we um, started using uh, human-centered design when thinking about the healthcare space. So my background is I am not a designer, but working in an emergency room, working in the hospital in the U.S. healthcare system, what I saw was that there is bad design everywhere. Uh, I think healthcare is like the black hole of design. And for um, all of us who have touched the healthcare system, we have experienced bad design, whether it's in a product or service or medical device, uh, the user interface of electronic health record, uh, bad design can be uh, found everywhere. And what I started noticing in healthcare is that there's all these types of workarounds that we see when there is a um, poor uh, experience with the healthcare system that we have uh, built these workarounds to get around bad design. So I thought, um, being at an academic medical center, of how we can uh, redesign healthcare. And I, uh, this was about six years ago, and we um, had discovered this thing called design thinking, and we started. Uh, hanging out with designers. I have no background in design, but I started visiting architecture studios, design studios. And what I appreciated about the mindset of design is uh, the ability to create, prototype, iterate, fail. Uh, and this mindset of that it's okay to fail and that we can learn from failing. So what we did at my hospital was we built our own version of a design studio. We call it the Health Design Lab. And the materials that we use to design are, um, they're, they're different from what a designer uses. They're not physical materials, but we design with medical data, for example, from MRIs and CT scans. In our lab, we have prototyping tools like 3D printers where we plan for uh, surgical operations by 3D printing anatomical models. We have a medical device program where we look at a challenge in the healthcare space. Uh, we try to understand the problem and we design a new type of product or device. So we encourage medical students and physicians to use design for storytelling, to show their work. Uh, we use design to uh, reimagine a healthcare service or product. And the methods that we use are storyboarding, skits, prototyping, and we'll go over more of that in our later workshop that we're going to have after uh, this webinar. But if you want to learn more about our methods, you know, we published this cookbook of design and healthcare called Health Design Thinking. And there we lay out our principles and methods for using uh, design thinking in the healthcare space. So. Um, what I appreciate about um, using design in healthcare is that it helps us to become better communicators. It really lowers the barrier to innovation. And we've seen that in the pandemic when there wasn't enough time to wait. We really had to prototype quickly and implement a new service or a device in, in, in the healthcare sector. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Morgan, who's gonna introduce our next speakers. Thank you, Vaughn. I am excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Ibrahim, who is a practicing surgeon, but he also practices architecture and urban planning at the University of Michigan. He's the chief medical officer at the leading architecture firm, HOK. He directs the Health and Design Fellowship at the University of Michigan, where he trains architects in, um, in rigorous econ econometric quantitative analytics to inform better design. Dr. Ibrahim, it's great to see you and welcome. Good morning and good afternoon. Always good to hang out uh, with some good friends. Um, good to see you all. Um, I'm excited to share a couple ideas with you from my world of design, health, and um, one unique lens I have is also through the world of policy. Um, and so I um, will emphasize that a little bit. And I think like all of you, we care a lot about impact. And um, the title is Designing for Impact. And I wanna give you a cautionary story from health policy where we really thought a lot about impact and kind of what that means for design. Um, those are the two things that got mentioned by Morgan there. Um, so as she mentioned, so I'm a practicing general surgeon. I operate every Thursday, I'm on call one in five. And that's really kind of think at the core of my identity and think about frontline healthcare. 
Um, I'm a formally trained health services researcher. I'm part of a pretty large research group. Um, we probably publish close to 30, 40 papers a year um, and are pretty active in this design and policy space. And before I did all that, I studied architecture. Um, so I trained at the Bartlett in London um, and then joined um, the American Institute of Architects through a lot of their health and design committees and then became the chief medical officer at HOK. I'm doing a lot of both healthcare and non-healthcare uh, work. So I think about design on three scales. Um, I think about it really at the hospital design level, how do you actually design a better hospital and hospital floor plan. Um, I scale it up to think about like networks of hospitals and how do you redesign sort of regional delivery of care. Um, and then I go all the way up to the urban planning level and think about health and neighborhoods. And so that's sort of the lens I take to this question. And when I think about design, um, I can't resist telling this cautionary tale that I think has a lot of lessons for all of you who are motivated to have a lot of impact. Um, so I lived in Washington, D.C. during the Affordable Care Act now over a decade ago. And if you lived anywhere near D.C. at the time, the only thing anyone talked about was the triple aim. Um, and it was this idea that to do something meaningful in healthcare, you had to improve quality, you had to decrease cost, and you had to improve things at a population scale. But if you were there, you really know that it was really about decreasing cost. costs. If you wanted traction on both sides of the aisle, that's really what you had to do. So the bad news is, is it's pretty much all about money. But the good news is, is it's almost all about money and people respond to that. And if you have incentives, um, people will respond to that and you can actually have high skill impact. So let me tell you about this policy gone wrong and you'll see that it has a lot of cautionary tales and lessons for how we think about design, um, tech and the future of healthcare. So readmissions were probably one of the most commonly talked about problems in healthcare a decade ago um, because they were common, costly and preventable. One in five patients were getting readmitted from the hospital right after they left. Uh, it was estimated that it was costing that health system $17 billion annually, and as many as at least a third of them could probably be prevented. So, you know, when you're thinking about your startup world, like what a great opening pitch. You have a common problem that costs a lot of money, and you think you have a way to fix at least a third of it. There's like a real opportunity there. So the government passed this program, created this program called the Hospital readmission reductions program. You don't have to worry about the weeds of it too much, but essentially it was a one to 2% payment penalty to hospitals if their readmission rates were too high. And it focused on these three conditions. So the early results is in the New England Journal um, after the first five years of the program were like impressive. You just saw these readmission rates dropping after the program was announced. And when the penalty started, people had already improved. And not only did it improve for the targeted conditions, but for the non-targeted conditions, those also got better. So I saw that as a surgeon and I kind of got super excited and I said, could this even be true in surgery? So the program got expanded to surgery. And sure enough, we actually found the same thing, that readmission rates actually went down for surgery, both in the procedures that were targeted and the ones that weren't. So at first glance, you think like the policy worked, right? Like what a great policy. They identified an important problem, they created a real incentive and um, implemented some really impressive results. Um, but not too long after some really unintended consequences were identified. Um, people had identified that the conditions that were targeted actually had higher mortality rates. And there was a concern that doctors were reluctant to readmit patients to the hospital um, who may have needed it because they didn't want to be penalized in that program. And so this paper concluded that um, that really this increase in mortality that was seen for these conditions was really due to this program. Um, it's not very often that healthcare nerdiness gets to make like the front time front page of the New York Times. Uh, but here it is, three really strong academics from Harvard talking about this policy going wrong. And then Peter Orzag, who is um, the head of the OEM uh, during the Obama administration, really kind of defending it publicly. Um, so it raises the question, how did readmissions actually improve? And I wanna talk you through that in this context, but for you to think about when you're starting to measure your startup, your product, your company, 
and you're following some key metrics to think about like, why did our numbers get better? And having a real good understanding, um, and you'll see why that matters in a second. So in my mind, there's a couple ways to improve outcomes. One is you actually improved the care delivery. And um, you would take a closer look and say like, well, when did things actually get better? And it's kind of interesting that almost all of the improvements made in readmission rates almost seem to happen overnight. Like within one quarter, everyone's readmission rates drop significantly. And so I'm a nerd and I told you I trained in econometrics, so I've thought a ton about measurement. And if you told me that someone's measurement of an outcome improved that quickly, I would be suspicious that they're changing the way they're measuring. And so it turns out that instead of just asking how do you improve outcomes, the real question was risk adjusted outcomes because you weren't just measured on your readmission rate, you were actually measured uh, on a risk adjusted outcome um, for how much risk or how much risk patients had for being readmitted. So is it plausible that people were actually just upcoding the risk of patients so that their risk adjusted rate would go down instead of actually improving care delivery? Well, this is straight out of um, McKinsey's advisory consulting board that basically told healthcare systems to obtain appropriate risk adjusted revenue from Medicare, providers must put additional focus on documenting acuity, the patient conditions. So it actually seemed that really what happened was patients that the policy that was designed to reduce readmissions actually got people to just code risk better. Um, and so that's a researchable question. You can actually try to figure that out. So here are readmission rates um, for without accounting for severity of risk. And you kind of see like it didn't really change. But when you take into account the um, risk severity changes that people are documenting, you actually see that whole drop that we observed happen in readmission rates all correlate um, with the same time that people started documenting more risk. So in our paper, we found that two thirds of the readmissions were actually just due to changes in um, documentation as opposed to real reductions. And I think one of the cool things about healthcare in the geek world is other people find your work and build on it. Um, so this is David Grabowski from Harvard who saw our work and asked, you know, what happened after the Affordable Care Act that made it possible for everybody to just document more severity? Like, did everyone just read that report I showed you and thought like, that's what we should do? Um, no, there's actually a different phenomenon. Medicare had actually changed the rules for how many diagnoses you were allowed to code up to 25 and has previously capped at 10. So what did they find? Now, um, this graph over here shows you the number of diagnoses patients had who are being admitted. After this rule was passed, which is interestingly right around the same time of the readmission reductions program, most of the patients got coded with 11 more or more diagnoses, which never would have been possible beforehand. So they actually concluded that they thought the policy had no effect. And, you know, just prior to this paper, people were still celebrating. This was one of the best health policies that we've ever come up with that actually moved the needle forward. And it turns out a lot of it was actually just due to changes in documentation. So let me tell you kind of I want to just pause for you for one second because we're not seeing your screen. So if you're sharing, if you could just share your screen. Uh, it should be shared, but I'll reshare. Just make sure. Still there? Here and... Just making sure. Oh. How about that? Did that work? Yes, great. Great. Thanks so much. So let me give you kind of four lessons learned for design from kind of this policy gone wrong that I think are really relevant for you to think about as your starting your um, really ambitious goals of innovating the healthcare space. Um, one is that incentives definitely work. If you place large enough incentives, people will change their behavior. 
In this case, it wasn't necessarily the behavior that you wanted, uh, but the incentives really do work. Um, second is that there's a real spillover effect. If you target the right part of healthcare with your innovation, it actually spills over and can have impact on areas around it. Um, third, and I think this is something we frankly just don't do enough in design, is to think about unintended consequences. What's the worst case scenario if everybody bought your product? What's the worst case scenario if everyone thought your design was the way they, they should build their hospital? We rarely think that way. Um, and then finally, plan your evaluation up front. So I have a little bit of a nerdy bend to this because I'm trained in measurement science and econometrics, but before you even launch your product, think about how are you going to know if it worked or not? How are you going to evaluate? What measures are you going to use? And decide those up front so you have a really accurate way to do it. So that I'll say thank you. And I hope if any of you get a chance to come to Michigan, um, let me know. and I'll take you to a football game. Um, all right. I think I'm all done. Thank you very much, Dr. Andrew Ibrahim. Um, can you hear me? Um, I'd like to remind the audience members to please ask questions in the chat box, and we will be able to get to the questions for any of our speakers at the end of the program today. Our next speaker in our last speaker is, Dr. is Alan Chachnov, who is a founding chair of the MFA Products of Design program at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. He's also the partner of Core 77, which is a design network that serves a global community of designers and design enthusiasts starting in 1995. Alan, welcome. Morning, my afternoon. It's great to be here. Uh, let me start sharing my screen and you can let me know um, if that works. How's that? Does that sound good? Look, look good? Sounds good. Great. Um, so I'm here and just interrupt me if things aren't moving uh, to talk about the four frames of designers as I see them. Um, so my background is uh, in design, industrial design specifically, and in medical, uh, surgical instruments, diagnostic equipment. Um, and now uh, I'm really, uh, so much of my life is design education. Everything working okay? Okay. Uh, my philosophy is that to design anything is to design everything. Um, so let me be a little bit more specific about that. Uh, all design projects are going to need design research, systems design, design strategy, physical products, digital products, human-centered design, planet-centered design, interaction design, platform design, policy design, which was just mentioned, and I promise this was already in the slide. Um, so I validate that policy design actually may be the most um, impactful uh, design moving forward. Social innovation design, service design, experience, community design, business modeling, and branding. And these aren't, aren't, aren't all of them really. Um, but today I want to talk about four things in particular, four frames for design, the product, the service, the platform, and the community. Um, and now some of you might be thinking, well, isn't the community what we would uh, normally understand as take stakeholders? Um, and I'd like you to actually um, change your mind about that term because that um, community is really a kind of pushback to strictly user-centered design. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. Uh, I'm, I'm really a, a fan of examples. I wanna show you a bunch of design uh, to, to help you understand these, these points that I'm trying to make. This is Xu Mangmu uh, who created a product called Lolly Temp. Uh, and uh, she also pushed back on this idea that this is what healthcare looks like. Uh, this isn't what uh, real medicine looks like. This is probably more uh, what it looks like um, and, and this. And so she came up with this notion that you could turn a thermometer um, into a lollipop. And it, this is a piece of candy, a circle of candy that is surrounded by six different uh, you know, chocolates, M&Ms, that have different melting points, right? Uh, so this is a, a pretty clever idea. It's speculative design. This does not exist. Uh, this is probably done in, I don't know, one week, maybe in design school. And so here the product is a lollipop. The service uh, is around diagnostics, um, uh, fever in this case. The platform is candy, but the community is really um, a bunch of ironists. There's the kids who are expecting a treat. There's the medical establishment who, you know, shouldn't be feeding sugar to 
um, a child, but then we all know that um, often you'll get a lollipop at the end of uh, a checkup. So this is this is kind of bizarre. Uh, Smoochie Idea did a project called Upgrade, designing for access and acceptability, uh, accessibility uh, around limb loss and limb difference. Um, and uh, so uh, designers do a lot of system mapping. They speak to uh, a lot of experts. They like to animate a lot of slides. Um, and Smoochie looked at this uh, challenge uh, at four different scales, individual community systems and culture. I'm going to show you one project that she did around individuals um, where she asked, how can design help mitigate challenges at an individual level? Um, and here she had interviewed one um, user, one expert, Christina, uh, who um, uh, an amputee, uh, had remarked to her, she said that most times at night when I'm not wearing my prosthetic, I crawl or hop on the floor from my bed um, to the bathroom. So, so th this was not a big um, sort of research point. My understanding is this was really kind of an off the cup conversational remark that when she has to pee, she like crawls to the bathroom. Um, and as a designer, Smooty heard this sentence and, and it kind of changed everything. Um, and really the next day she, uh, she conceptualized uh, Swift, um, a kind of slipper uh, prosthetic. And so this is pretty brilliantly designed. It's very beautiful. It's flexible. Um, so it can fit uh, different leg sizes um, and it can be 3D printed. You can customize it. Um, and so uh, here the product is really a slipper. Uh, the service is mass customization. Uh, the platform is dignity though. Um, that's really what she is working on in the community uh, of amputees, although there's a lot more people involved in here. Let me let me increase the complexity a little bit. This is Pontea Parsa, who did a project, Frey, um, uh, around uh, reproductive freedom uh, for her thesis. And I'm actually going to let uh, Pontea um, introduce this project. But anyone should have the chance to get the care they need regardless of who they are. And with that in mind, I facilitated a co-creation workshop called Reproductive Autonomy. In this workshop, I used the game of snakes and ladders to ask women what full reproductive autonomy looks like for them and what supports and hinders it. And that's when one of my participants said that every time she has sex, it feels like a negotiation over contraceptives. That made me realize that I was too focused on women instead of their relationship with their partners. Because after all, none of these women got pregnant by themselves. I found out that the journey starts a lot earlier with men's responsibility towards their partners. But that's when it gets tricky because most women are naturally reminded of their reproductive capacity with every menstrual cycle, and men are very remote from this experience. But how might we use menstrual blood as a mediator for open communication about reproductive health? And for that, I designed Frey. Frey is a speculative object for watering and fertilizing plants using a mixture of blood and water. Blood is generally used as a plant fertilizer since it contains three important plant nutrients. But Frey doesn't only nurture plants, it also nurtures women's relationship with their partners. Let's see how it works. <laughs> deliberately designed Frey as messy, conspicuous, and high maintenance to show the importance of empathy and engagement among intimate partners. Okay, um, here the product is essentially a watering can. Um, the service is around nurturing plants. 
Uh, the platform is probably around gender politics. You could type a lot of terms um, into this category. Um, and her community is dealing with partners um, and sometimes married partners. Uh, two more projects, Ria Bandari, a project called Paint, um, as part of her thesis, Hysterical Women Designing Experiences to Counter Gaslighting in Healthcare uh, Systems. And so this was just one part of her thesis. This was an app for self-reporting um, symptom uh, pain symptoms. Um, doctors are forced to interrupt the patient very often. Doctors only have uh, time to hear relevant information, and that term relevant is, is you know, dubious. Patients don't have tools to describe their own symptoms. Um, and uh, here's a few screenshots, but I will uh, let Rhea introduce this, uh, tell you a little bit more about this project herself. So there were one common theme which was uh, which was talked about uh, from doctors and patients, which was the lack of an objective way to measure pain. The current pain measurement scale, the Wong Baker pain scale looks like that and is very subjective. So the doctor has a hard time understanding the patient's threshold because your pain level seven could be very different from my pain level seven. So to counter that, I organized Women in Pain, a co-creation workshop to test alternate ways to measure and describe pain. Women describe their symptoms, severity and frequency through words, through two dimensional scribbles and three dimensional embodiment. And through these, I understood that visual cues work the best and that it's all about effective storytelling for patients as protagonists to share their stories with their doctors, friends and family members to understand their own pain. But this is where it gets tricky because the patient isn't equipped to talk about their symptoms. On average, the patient is interrupted within 11 seconds of their history taking process. And that's because of the systemic issue of having limited time that forces the doctors to interrupt the patient so soon. So, I organized Clinic Charades, which is an experience that prompts people to explore visual cues to illustrate their pain. And I narrowed down my focus for this activity to invisible symptoms for both men and women. These are symptoms that can't be seen physically or tested, so it makes them even harder to describe. Um, so I'm talking about symptoms like dizziness, heartburn, phobia, things like that. So let's take a look at how it played out. <laughs> that there are three tiers of support uh, that, uh, that in a women's life that I as a designer could have an impact on. So from here, I look at the home, the hospital, and the settings outside the hospital. So clinic charades led me to create something which was much more accessible for the individual self at home. I would like to introduce to you paint. Paint is designed to help women advocate for themselves and enable it enables patients to document and describe their pain in more than just words. With the app, patients can visualize their pain in real time by scribbling on or marking relevant areas on a human uh, on the silhouette of a human body. And the app allows the patients to specify the location, the intensity and the duration of the pain. And additionally, you can express how you feel at a part in the particular moment through text and emojis, voice notes, as well as images. And an aggregation of these entries helps the patients create their own painscapes. Uh, painscapes show them and their doctor where exactly their pain is manifesting. So you can either send this to your doctor or the patient could print it and it could be a part of the patient records. All right, so uh, in this project, the product is a mobile app um, the service is self-reporting 
the platform may not be an electronic health record. The platform might actually be around a kind of um, compliance. And uh, this is a tricky word. I'm using it a little bit abstractly. Um, this is a kind of um, truth telling as well. The community, well, we're not sure. The patient, uh, patient advocates, families, uh, doctors, nurses, medical establishment. Uh, let me show you one more example and, and talk to you a little bit about how the community can get fuzzier and fuzzier. Um, so this is Turn Timer um, by Adam Hecht, Daniel Choi, Mark Kurilis, and Vinu Rajas Dran. Um, this was done actually at the Health Design Lab um, called Turn Timer. It's a pressure ulcer solution. Uh, so the challenge obviously around pressure ulcers uh, can can be you know quite serious and often uh, leading to fatalities. Um, and patients aren't turned um, often enough, of course. We know this. There are a couple of solutions that are uh, well, you know highly priced and and sometimes not so effective. Um, and so the challenges here, I think many attending this event will understand um, very intimately. Um, this is a timer that um, counts down and has red and green um, colors uh, alerting when it's time to turn the patient. Um, there's actually a dashboard here, the OWL portal, uh, so that nurses can see um, patients that uh, need turning. And what's interesting here, I'm going to go back in a slide, is who is this actually for? Um, and one of the, the communities that the designers were thinking about here were the families, that there would be a lot of family pressure um, once they saw that the, um, their, their family, their loved one had not been turned and they would, tur they would become advocates so that this may not be actually for the nursing staff, this may be for visiting family members. So here the product is a smart object, the service is about reducing bed sores. Um, the platform, uh, perhaps a dashboard or a portal, uh, but the community, community is not clear at all. It isn't one community. There's the patient, the families of the patient, the nursing staff. Uh, we haven't talked at all about um, insurance um, in the insurance industry. Uh, this is a huge, although Andrew touched on this before. Uh, so much of this, so much of medicine um, is about money. So I'm hoping that uh, this helps you think a little bit differently about um, all the different products and services and platforms that happen uh, in the healthcare context, um, but also the community is in which they are designed for, and sometimes the unintended consequences of the communities uh, on the communities that they are not designed for. Uh, all right, thanks so much. Uh, and this is me if you'd like to get in touch at Trochinov. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to hear um, from each of you speakers today. We do have some questions from the audience. Please continue to ask questions in Zoom and we will um, address them to our speakers. Um, first, I have a question for each of you. You've spoken about co-creation of products and how um, people can build empathy by understanding the perspective of patients and users of these products. So um, in the cost and the dignity, I wonder how entrepreneurs listening to you speak can use co-creation and better understand um, the perspective of the patient and help them create their products. Um, I guess I'll jump in because I showed a lot of it. I mean, we uh, teach it explicitly, um, actually working with appropriate communities around different challenges. And a lot of the projects that the thesis students um, uh, work on are, you know, do touch the uh, medical world. Um, it's really about um, this keyword facilitation. Um, how do you get the participants to create and offer something that you didn't know that you were looking for. This is this is a bit of a conundrum in design research, right? You are not looking to validate your ideas. I mean, there is some research that's there to validate ideas, um, but for designers, the this truly valuable research is the research that shines a light in a room uh, on some sort of insight where you didn't even know that room existed. Never mind, you know that you know this person experienced this this kind of um, uh, pain point or provocation or motivation and incentive. Uh, so research is really really tricky because often you will 
have a hypothesis and then go out and try and prove or disprove it. Co-creation workshops are much more in some sense qualitative than quantitative. They are looking for something that they didn't know they were looking for. Um, this is this is tricky because people do not like ambiguity. Uh, designers are trained to be comfortable in ambiguity. It's one of the reasons why the uh, the profession is so fun. Let me just <clears throat> add one more perspective to that. Um, there's a great book called Looking Smarts that I think if you're in the ambitious world of startups, it's worth reading. But it talks about that when you're making major decisions, who should you have in the room? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that being a rookie, in other words, like being new to a space, gives you an unfair advantage mm -hmm. in a lot of ways because you're not ingrained in whatever the normative answers are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you, I imagine your teams probably have a lot of experts um, in dedicated areas and those are important, but I would make sure just practically that you have some real rookies in the room who are ambitious, mm -hmm. motivated, but who maybe don't have content expertise on that topic. Mm -hmm. Why did you think about it that way? Why would anyone want to do it like that? Mm -hmm. And it turns out some of the like, naivety of that perspective is actually super informative. So. Um, get some rookies on your team. <laughs> Could I actually double underline that, Andrew? It's such an important point. You know, rookies don't know what they're not supposed to not know, right? They have this kind of permission to just say something um, and they're not worried about their ego or, or their, again, their domain expertise being in question. Um, this is, it's gold. Um, so I could not agree more with this point. And just to jump on that, to really respect the expertise of patients and that they are experts of their own mm -hmm. disease and that we should be involving them way earlier on in the mm -hmm. design process. And it's a continuous um, feedback between mm -hmm. the product or solution, the patient, uh, the healthcare entrepreneur. And too often we bring in the expertise of the patient too late when when yeah. a team and or company has already developed a product and think about market size and how to penetrate into the market. But I think uh, companies can benefit from involving the expertise of patients very early on in their process. Yeah, they say that 80% of a design's impact is determined in the first 20% of the design process. That's probably lowballing it. Uh, there's also an interesting prepositional um, change that the design world has been moving through, which is designing for someone to designing with someone. And now we're at a moment where we're talking about designed by, that there is a kind of authorship and uh, equity uh, that goes in the patients or the participants, uh, well, participation in the design process, uh, which I think is wonderful and, and healthy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, one question, can you provide some practical tips on how entrepreneurs can use the design thinking process while they're developing their products? Go, go ahead, Andrew. Well, I was gonna say you can buy Bond's book. Uh, well, let me give you, um, there's certainly a lot of frameworks and workshops for design thinking, but let me give you a sort of specific tangible thing that um, we've learned the hard way in kind of the surgical device world. Um, when you're thinking about monitoring the impact of your product, you can spend a lot of money on surveys and different companies and apps and whatever, but I go back to the money. So there's a fascinating story of the lap band or the lap gastric band that people use for morbid obesity and surgery that we virtually don't use at all anymore. Um, but 15 years ago, it was one of the most common procedures done in the United States. What's fascinating about it is the FDA ended up putting out their concerns far, far later. But if you actually just looked at the billing data of how much money was spent to put the device in versus how much money was spent to remove it, you would have known years ago that the device was having issues. And so I think actually just looking at simple bottom lines of how much is being spent on your device to like put it in use or to take it out of use is a real practical early signal 
of if things are working. Yeah, I would support that. Um, I think you want to look at the the levers of change, right? And so one of the ways that I think about the role of design is that designers may not have their hands on the levers of change. Uh, they put their hand on the hands that have that are holding the levers of change and they can say, well, look over here like this could this could work. And again, very often that will be around policy or regulatory. Um, it will be around finance, insurance, payers, payees. Looking at the larger systems um, in the, of the world where you want your product or service or platform or app to not only survive, but to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we teach in our master's program is that uh, is, is fundamental systems thinking uh, over and over and over. Um, and maybe the quickest takeaway for um, our, our participants or our audience here today um, is that very often you need to, uh, to design the conditions around the artifact that you're creating as opposed to obsess on the artifact. You really need to look at the neighborhood at sort of you know increasing levels of scale to help determine its likelihood for success and survival. Um, and that that's way richer than just doing a competitive analysis and seeing who else is in the marketplace. Um, to get, have a fundamental understanding of like, what is the terrain you are trying to play in and to take your, your sort of eyes off the ball in, in, in a sense and to look at the playing field. Um, and again, not just in terms of competitors, but really look at the system effect um, in that in that marketplace that you're trying to participate in. Uh, and in some sense, like you know what what's going to be in your way to try and predict a little bit? Um, and then positively to try and take advantage of trends or market conditions that are in some that are going to like love your product or service or app or platform uh, that are going to welcome it because the the timing and the position is right. Uh, and then you talk to the the people, the communities that are 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 going to matter, that are either going to stop it from happening or or you know want it more than anything, that are going to like you know love it um, to happen. And Alan, what I, what I learned from you around this like landscape is to look at all the different sort of users of of the product, and you know in design we think about these extreme users, um, you know someone that. Uh, maybe doesn't fall within 80% of your market for your device or product yeah. or service. Where, where what a pitfall that I see with a lot of companies is that they design a product for people who look <laughs> just like them or people who yeah. are the same socioeconomic profile. And you know, instead, like the and especially in the U.S. healthcare market, the users are so different uh, depending upon which state, which location, which yeah. city. And like, how do you dev uh, design something for that extreme user? So uh, someone who does not have your shared experience, maybe it's someone who is uninsured, you know, living in an urban area, a single mom with three kids and uh, has to take a bus and a train oh. to work. So it's going to be, that's going to look very different from uh, a white male who lives in the Bay Area, who's a, a, a techie mm -hmm. geek bro. Sometimes it's something really obvious, like the customer that you didn't, you know, you're designing for for a certain kind of patient, where it's the patient's kid that's actually making the buying decision, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think when you realize it, it's just like, how did we miss this? This is so obvious. But sometimes it really is um, under under your nose. In terms of the the terrain, one thing that I might add is that you know very often every domain has like three or four different players. Um, and they often like, you know, either actively don't like each other or they think they don't like each other. It's just like medicine is all about, you know, the, the patient um, practitioner relationship. Medicine is all about science. Medicine is all about money. Medicine is all about policy. Of course, all of these things are true. But to understand that there are people who passionately believe that this is everything you need to understand, the designer needs to step back and to see these three or four or five groups who who passionately believe that you know sort of their reality is the reality and to in some sense synthesize uh, amongst those in terms of well what truth is going to surface out of this that is going to satisfy um, 
you know, the need that the designer is going going after in this very sort of holistic way. Um, when it works, it's amazing. Um, but you can you can miss things pretty easily. Thank you so much. Um, I love your answers. Uh, Luna, do we have time for one more question? I think we do. So we have, time for, we have time for one short question. OK, perfect. Um, so Alan, you mentioned this briefly when you were speaking, but how can um, entrepreneurs avoid unintended consequences when they're creating? Yeah, so this is the question of great question, whoever um, posed that. Um, it is the question of the day. I mean, it is the question on planet Earth. Um, and I think the answer is not is not a lovely answer. The answer is that everything is systemic um, from climate change to um, political disarray to um, human nature. Um, everything is connected to everything. And it's one of the reasons why I think people feel um, a little bit helpless and sometimes hopeless um, these days. And I think that this pandemic, uh, and again, some parts of the world uh, where I am, you know, in New York, we seem to be very lucky. We have this idea that it's post-pandemic. It's not post-pandemic. Most of the world is not post-pandemic. Um, and I think that this this um, the situation has made us aware of how connected we are, uh, and so we need to we need to identify so many different. I don't hear them. Okay, great. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Alan. Bon, Morgan, and Andrew. Uh, this was really a fantastic conversation that broadened our thinking uh, tremendously. And if there's sort of one thread that I would say that's kind of running through each of your presentations, it's maybe a set of questions that you've put before us, and that's really considering who we're designing for, who we're designing with and how do we kind of bring those um, patients and stakeholders uh, along with us in the process and and who is in the room actually doing the designing and ensuring that we have um, a broad set of, of maybe experts and rookies i hope that for the entrepreneurs the designers and the operators online today that this discussion has been thought provoking maybe uh, better put design provoking um, whether it's Andrew's framework um, and really kind of broadening your perspective on who the community is or uh, prototyping to uh, come up with some of the unintended consequences of, of our decisions. Um, I hope that these themes may be more prominent and carry with you as you continue on in your design. So I would like to thank everyone who joined us today. We hope that you will continue to stay in this conversation with us at Tech Meets Design and consider how you can incorporate design as you build technology solutions. We are going to be breaking out into a closed workshop with our speakers from today and a select number of startups in the healthcare space. So definitely look out for highlights. We are gonna be posting those on the Tech Meets Design website which is jlmtechmeets.design. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Tech Meets Design event. Thanks everybody and have a great afternoon.